Good morning. Uh, it's good to be back with you. I was out uh, here uh, the last week <laughs> uh, visiting family and uh, for some much needed rest. Um, we're grateful though to have you with us today and watching online with us. Of course, always we encourage you to, uh, to visit us in person if you're able. Uh, we'd love to be able to meet you and greet you uh, face to face. Uh, but we're glad that you are joining us and are able to be encouraged by uh, the songs which point us back to the character of God, remind us what he has done for us, uh, as well as in the word, um, in which we are further brought face to face with who he is and how we respond uh, in light of that. Uh, and so as we uh, continue this morning, let's just bow in a word of prayer, ask the Lord to bless it uh, and to guide our time together. Let's pray. Father, we are immensely grateful. I want to say that first and foremost for those that are taking advantage of these means today. Uh, I know they're in various parts of our, not only our state, but the country and around the world and uh, ask that you would um, bless the believers that are watching. Uh, may they have a greater understanding of who you are today. Uh, may they sense your presence uh, and may the things that are said and songs that are sung today bring encouragement to their hearts uh, as well as um, urge them and, and um, spur them on uh, to greater acts of love uh, and of righteousness that you call us to. Uh, I realize as well that there may be those watching online today that are, are just getting back into spiritual things. And so I pray that this, this morning, um, it would be a time of continuing to spark that interest, of, of leading them to you and ultimately to Christ. Um, I realize that there may be some watching that have um, just exploring even who you are and have not yet, do not yet have that relationship uh, that we uh, are so grateful for that we have with Christ. And I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would understand indeed the great need that we all had uh, and do have um, the need of a savior uh, because of our sin and our debt uh, and the graciousness that you have shown us in providing uh, him uh, and his uh, sacrifice on the cross for us as the avenue uh, for escape um, from what we faced. Uh, thank you for that, that, um, that act of love uh, which uh, not only shows us um, the quality of who you are, uh, but gives us a framework even of how to love those around us. Uh, guide us today. Um, we are grateful for your grace and your mercy, which are indeed new every morning toward us and which are always there. We thank you. We praise you. And we pray this all in your name. Amen.
we look at the persecuted church today, I'd like to draw to our attention Christians in Syria. Uh, February, of course, of 2023, we know that there was that terrible earthquake, that 7.8 magnitude earthquake that really shook uh, the areas of Turkey and of Syria. Uh, And the aftershocks even that came after that, uh, all of those things combined giving, bringing considerable damage uh, and loss of life even uh, to that, those regions. Uh, of course, often as in with news though, it seems in the days and months that follow that event, much of it has been forgotten. Even a, a recent inter- internet search I did this past week most of the headlines are in that February, March timeline, and then after that, there is almost nothing anymore uh, for reports on what is happening there. Uh, the major news networks are not focused on that anymore. They've moved on to greater and better things, but we want to return our focus back there this morning and what's going on. In addition, though, to that earthquake uh, and all the trouble that it caused, Syrian Christians have been facing persecution for many, many years. In fact, Christians in Syria grapple daily uh, with persecution that may become violent uh, despite the public threat uh, from so-called is- the so-called Islamic State having largely subsided in present day. Uh, in areas though where Islamic extremist groups are active, any public expression of faith is dangerous. And we know that that is similar to many other Muslim majority countries throughout the world. Sharing the gospel is very risky. Church buildings are off, often have been completely destroyed. And the abduction of church leaders continues to have a considerably negative impact on Christian communities. And in addition to that, the uh, Christian population in Syria has diminished in many respects due to the ongoing civil war there. In fact, for the last 12 years, it's been going on. At various phases, sometimes it's more intense than others, but it's continued for that time. Um, and so now, much of what is left from, uh, of Christians or people coming to faith is Christians coming from a Muslim background, which has additional complications uh, when, it, when we talk about persecution. Uh, as their family rejects them, they may be attacked. Um, women who convert while married to a Muslim face divorce, even the loss of the, the custody of their children. Um, according to uh, Islamic law. And so there's, there's all of these things hitting them. Um, and, and so where do we go from there, I guess? Um, there was a pastor, I was reading a report that had noted that his own church had declined by 60% um, simply because many people have fled the country. Uh, they are tired of dealing with um, the situation, with the persecutions going on. Uh, in some cases, it's causing, of course, loss of jobs and livelihood, and so they're moving to provide for their families. And, and, and that's under, we can understand those sorts of things. Um, but it is, there's this continual, if you will, um, push toward as in many other Muslim majority countries, of seeing the truth of God stifled, seeing the gospel of Christ um, wiped out, uh, and so it is not heard anymore. And it's discouraging for believers to see others leaving. Uh, Now, as we hear these things personally, we can be greatly discouraged. You know, it seems at times like the reign of evil in our world um, is is continuing to grow, Uh, it cannot be overcome. Um, I I think in some respects for us, it can arrest even the joy in our own hearts and we begin questioning whether or not there's any good anywhere anymore. But I want to remind us that as we talk about these things on a a weekly basis, that Jesus told us that these days would come, that there would be trouble, that um, just as he was persecuted, that those who follow him could expect to be persecuted as well. And the believers in Syria face these hardships because their countrymen are seeking to eradicate God from their lives and country. And that's that's nothing new. We've been reading about that in Romans. Uh, Man has been doing this since shortly after time (laughs) uh, began, that he thinks he knows better than God and he's seeking to live apart from him and without him. And that, of course, leads to all these other actions that we see going on toward believers in these countries. 
Um, we're encouraged, though, as we think about what we've just been talking about in Romans recently. Is God still sovereign? Yes, he is. Will those who persecute believers be held accountable by God? Yes, they will. Is God still working for the good of these believers? Yes, he is. Um, I, I was, as I was looking at Syria this week, I was reflecting back on Romans 8 again and the fact that he foreknew them, he called them, he justified them, he's given them salvation, and that is proof that he is for their good continually, even though they are experiencing these things. Um, and as we hear these, we're, we're brought back to the, the writer of Hebrews who uh, tells us to remember them as though we were in prison with them, to uh, remember the ill-treated as though we too felt their torment. And if Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, I believe it's the last part of verse 18, talks about us always, uh, encourages us to always keep on praying for all the saints. And so as, as discouraging sometimes as these things may be, they make our prayers more informed as we're before the throne of grace uh, and keep us abreast of what's going on in these various places throughout the world, uh, specifically Syria and what the Christians there are facing. Is there good news, though, to be heard amidst the tragedies of persecution? Um, I don't know the exact timing of, the, of this report, but one reporter noted that God is at work, he said. One of our contacts told us that an area in Syria where 18 months ago there were only 12 to 13 Christians, today there are more than 70 Christian families. As has happened in other areas like Iran and Egypt, people are seeing the true face of Islam and it is generating a real openness for the things of Christ, And so that is something encouraging, that even amidst all the persecution going on, the gospel is still going forth, the people are sick of the, the lies and the, um, this false religion and are turning toward the truth of God. A story from a believer from Aleppo um, captures, I think, the amazing faith of some of these believers, their spiritual endurance and their perspective. Uh, and one young woman in particular um, was part of this article. Uh, it writes that when the earthquake took place in February, Lucine and her family knew that they had to get out of their apartment. Um, a wave of dust raced from the living room to the bedroom and their apartment was beginning to crumble around them. She gripped her daughter's hand and they raced down the stairs, her daughter yelling out to her mom, don't let go of me, mom. If we die, we die together. They sprinted down the stairs, jumping over fallen masonry in the stairwell, making it outside, and they could hear the sounds of mortar and stone falling around their once familiar neighborhood. She was heartbroken. She says, I thought I would never see my home again. But her faith was intact. Even as the world around her broke into pieces, the family holds an unwavering hope in God's providence. We are Christians, and in times like these, we find strength in our unity, she says. We know that God is with us and he will guide us through this darkness. Of course, organizations like Open Doors have come and partnered alongside them and brought aid to these regions. Um, Open Doors specifically notes that engineers from our partner organization have begun inspecting homes of Syrian Christians to see if they are ready for occupancy. And in Aleppo alone, 1,200 homes have been inspected and were needed. Repairs have already started and Lucene's was one of those. Um, uh, every week, they note, uh, one of their partners says, uh, a Christian family, a uh, person or family I know is leaving the country, especially the younger generation. For me, every Christian around me in Syria is a reason to stay in the country, but it's getting harder and harder when I see people from my inner circle leaving. But when you're surrounded with people that didn't leave, you know you're not alone. And that was one of their partners. But uh, ladies like Lucine and her own family are, as, as they see each other sticking together, it is of great encouragement to each other. Uh, returning back to her story, they, they continue to remark that, that this is what makes the work on home restoration even more meaningful. It means that the Christian community can remain in Syria, growing the church there and acting as salt and light in their cities and neighborhoods. In fact, Lucine's apartment was under construction at the time that this article was written. Uh, one bedroom was finished and the family was so eager to go home that they all moved back to that single room of their home just so they could be back home together. Uh, we think it's hard once in a while if we've got to live in 1,200 square feet, manage living in a, you know, maybe a 10 by 10 room of an apartment, uh, but you're just happy to be home and with your family. Um, 
these things hopefully give us some notes of on the persecution front of what's happening, how we can be praying, but also how can we, we can be thanking God for the good things that we see going on uh, over there as well. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful um, that first and foremost for your word, because even in the midst of a dark world, your word gives us perspective. Uh, as we question whether or not uh, you are sovereign and conquering evil, um, whether or not you will ultimately win out in the end, we can camp on your word and we find truth there and we find guiding guidance for our lives and, and, and a filter through which to process the situations that we see going on, uh, just as, in, as here in Syria. Uh, and we're, we are told, even through your word, that in the midst of persecution, these trials and hardships, it is these things, it is the fire and the heat that ultimately produces endurance within us, uh, that perfects our faith. Um, and so we know that as, as uncomfortable as these things are, as hard as they are to experience, that, even, that you are even using these difficulties to further shape and mold people into the image of Christ uh, and to bring them uh, to where you desire them to be. We are greatly encouraged, though, at the same time to see uh, stories like these of, of the gospel spreading and reaching people's lives amidst darkness, uh, to see uh, partners supporting Christians there in Syria, and to see uh, the faith of those there uh, remain intact and be strong, in fact, stronger than ever. And I pray that that would encourage our own uh, walk with you. Um, that as we encounter even the little things in our own lives, um, that this would give us some perspective and, re and, and, and call us to see how these things might be building our own faith. Uh, Father, we look to you. Um, we know that you are watching over these believers here, uh, and we are so grateful and encouraged by that. Um, may you keep them in our thoughts, that we might lift them before the throne of grace daily. We pray this in your name. Amen. Tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried.
Jesus will heal. Jesus will help me. Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus. Oh, I must tell Jesus. Good morning. Have you ever said to anyone, that's not fair? Maybe you've said that as a child or a teenager or as an adult when you didn't get something else that's, or something that someone else got. Or maybe you saw some injustice someplace and you said, that's not fair. I say it almost every day as I hear news reports of injustices happening all over the world. It's very disheartening, isn't it? You know, free speech rights being violated, at least in our country and maybe in your country is where, wherever you are. People being arrested for talking to people near abortion clinics or the dam on the Dnipro River in Ukraine being destroyed, which is a war crime, but will likely never get prosecuted. You know, God has built into us humans a sense of right and wrong, but sin has skewed what we think is right and what we think is wrong uh, in many cases. Jeremiah 17, 9, a verse I've gone to many times, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. So we are really working with a handicap about what truth is unless we are thoroughly connected to God's truth in his word. But that ability to sense and judge right and wrong can make us wise and discerning in situations, but it can also make us critical and judgmental in ugly ways toward people. And sometimes we can even be critical of God, how he's running the world or our lives if we're hurting, going through some hard circumstances or dealing with difficult people. I haven't gone through the Bible to list all the people with complaints to God, but there are, are a bunch that would probably fit that category. Over years of ministry, I know people have questioned God's fairness or justice as they see injustice taking place. Let's do a quick review from last week. Remember chapters 9 through 11 in Romans are a unit. They need to stay together. And Paul is talking about the nation of Israel in these three chapters. If Jesus came as their Messiah, died for their sins to bring them into a right relationship with God by their faith in Jesus, why then are the Jews not coming to faith? Romans 8 ended with, nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus our Lord. It seems that the Jews are separated from God because they haven't trusted Jesus as Messiah. In Romans 9, 6, Paul makes that statement, it is not though, as though the word of God has failed. And Paul explains that God in his omniscient wisdom chose the very best plan to demonstrate his glorious character and power in eternity future, as well as right now. But God, we don't always understand what's going on right now though. But God promised a redeemer in Genesis chapter 3, one who would come to crush the serpent, that Satan, the leader of the rebel kingdom. The man and the woman God created in his own image had disobeyed him and drew the penalty of death upon themselves because of their disobedience, and they became part of the rebel kingdom. God quickly and graciously provided a solution for them. Animals died in their place as their substitutes. And Adam and Eve accepted God's gracious provision by faith, and they wore the clothes that God gave them instead of the fig leaves that they had put together for themselves to cover their nakedness. Much farther down the road in history, God chose a man named Abraham as the man through whom God would work and to make a great nation, and through that nation, the Redeemer would eventually come. And even though Abraham had a son through Sarah's maid, God specifically promised that his covenant would be through the son that Sarah would bear to him. And that son's name was Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah and she had twin sons and God specifically told her before the boys were born that the older son would serve the younger son. The line of the Redeemer would go through Jacob and not Esau. And that brought us to, ch to chapter nine, verse 14. The truth about God's choices seemed like God was being unjust or not fair in choosing Jacob over Esau. 
Last week we talked about antinomies for a few minutes. An antinomy is a contradiction between two equally valid principles or truth, and they are not reconcilable in our minds. God's sovereignty and human responsibility to him is an antinomy. On God's side of the equation, he has the eternal plan all laid out. It is the wisest and perfect plan that he put together. Our side of the equation in our side of the equation is that we make choices and decisions and we act upon them, but we're not puppets. God has given us those abilities. And then we come to verse 14. And Paul says, what shall we say then? He uses that expression often in his letter. Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. And here's lesson number one. God, as the sovereign creator, makes his own decisions about what he does. He's not accountable to anyone. There's no one above him. He always works within the bounds of his perfect and holy character. We can, we can always count on that. God is not doing something outside the framework of his own character. And Paul gives two examples. One example is Moses. And Moses on Mount Sinai asks to see God's glory. And Paul picks up uh, the verse in Exodus and it's in Romans 9 and verse 15. For God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And Paul uses it here to demonstrate that God makes his own decisions about who will receive his compassion and mercy. It's a slight difference in the meaning of the words. Compassion has to do with the feelings of pity, a touched heart for someone in need. And mercy is the action word to actually bring the help to the one who's suffering, the afflicted and in miserable condition. So then, it doesn't depend on human desire or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. So then is a conclusion word, and we see that there. God's not obligated to do anything for us. What he does for us is purely out of his mercy and grace toward us. And then uh, Paul uses Pharaoh. He's going to use him a couple times in this particular chapter. And this verse that Paul uses here is out of Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16. But I'm going to read verse 15 because it adds something to our spec perspective. And God says, For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with plague, and you would have been destroyed from the earth. And now we go to Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up. And the nuance to that phrase, raised you up, is I let you remain, or I allowed you to live this long, that I might demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people by not releasing them. Now we have to understand the culture back in those days, Pharaoh was one of the gods in Egypt, which had many gods. Um, and I don't know if he was the chief god. I think the sun god might have been the chief god, but he was one of the gods. And Yahweh, the creator and true and living God, does not tolerate rivals. So Pharaoh is really in the crosshairs of being in trouble. Exodus 12:12 12, 12, uh, reiterates this, and God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt in the same night. I will attack all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both humans and animals, and, catch this, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And that included Pharaoh. And God says, I am Yahweh. Many times in Exodus and in the rest of the Old Testament, God does things so that people would know how uh, know unmistakably that he is the true and living God. And when God says that his name would be proclaimed in all the earth, his name actually means his personal character qualities. We know that from John 17, 6. Jesus was talking to God the Father, and he says to him, I made, your no I made known your name to the men that you gave me. And Jesus was not talking merely about a personal name. He was talking about the Father's character and his power. So keep that in mind as we are taking a look at this. So God is saying, what I'm doing will demonstrate my character. That is my name that will be proclaimed in all the earth. And then we again, another conclusion statement in verse 18. So then, God has mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy and he hardens whom he chooses to harden. 
Now, obviously, we need to explain this verse a little bit more. And first of all, let's see mercy toward a nation and then mercy toward an individual. And then we'll talk about hardening. And the, there's a good uh, um, illustration in Jonah. And I hope that you're familiar with Jonah. It's only four chapters long. You want to go back and read that, please do that. But in Jonah chapter four, Jonah is upset because uh, Nineveh repented and God didn't blow him off the map. I mean, these guys were terrorists. They were enemies of Israel. And Jonah was really hoping that that would take the place. But Jonah is arguing with God. And he says, uh, the reason I fled to Tarshish was because I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. And then later on in the chapter, God finishes the chapter by a question, a statement and a question. He says, Jonah, you, you pitied the plant for which you did not labor. You didn't make it grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And then the very last verse of Jonah, question, God says, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left hand and also many cattle? Now, it's my opinion that 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand is probably speaking of children. Children don't know their left hand and right hand, right hand and left hand. But you know, God had pity on that city. And they believed God. It says that in the text. And they repented of their evil ways. And God, in his mercy and grace, did not destroy the city in judgment. Read what happened to them, though, a hundred years later in the book of Nahum. You know, this was totally in keeping with how God works with nations and empires. And I read Jeremiah 18, 7, where God says, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck them up and break them down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent from the disaster that I intend to do, it, do to it. And, on the other hand, if at any time I declare uh, concerning a nation or a kingdom, I will build and plant it. And if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, I will relent of the good that I intended to do for it. You know, that's, that's a general statement that God is making that, of how he deals with the nations in the world. And, <laughs> you know, as I look at that verse, I, I see our own country the United States of America in those verses, and I think we're in trouble. Uh, we have not been listening to God's voice. We have been doing evil in his sight, and the good that God has given us is going to be removed. And then we also see not only mercy to a nation or a, a city, the city of Nineveh, capital of uh, the Assyrian Empire, we also see nation, uh, mercy to an individual. I'm just picking Naaman, the general of the Syrian army. He had leprosy. 2 Kings 5. And I'm going to jump through the story. I'm, you can go back and read that. But at the end of the story, Naaman says, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So he's talking to Elisha. Please accept a present from your servant. Elisha says, As Yahweh lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And Naaman urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman says, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, for now your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but Yahweh. He had trusted Yahweh uh, to save him. I believe he's now uh, part of the family of God. And uh, these two mule loads of earth, I think he was going to make a little place that he would build an altar and, and offer these sacrifices to Yahweh even in his home country of Syria. God saw his miserable condition and through a young Hebrew slave girl who also saw his pitiful condition of leprosy and what it had done to his family, suggested to Naaman's wife that he go see Elisha, the prophet, and Naaman was healed. And he's also a Gentile. So you see God's program in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament is always Jews and Gentiles. Those are the only two groups in the, in the world. Now, let's move to a hardened heart of an individual. It's really helpful to remember that we all, everyone, starts with a hard heart because of our sin nature. Jeremiah 17, 1 says, The sin of Judah is engraved with an iron chisel on their stone-hard hearts. 
It is the work of the Holy Spirit, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit that we could say softens our hearts and our souls to bring us to the realization that we're sinners and that we need a savior, namely Jesus. Now we're going to Pharaoh again, because God told Moses that he would harden Pharaoh's heart in chapter four in verse 21 of Exodus. And a few other times we read that Pharaoh hardened his heart and I believe it would be correct to say that God confirmed uh, Pharaoh's hard heart. Remember, Pharaoh thought of himself as a god. He was proud and defiant toward Yahweh, the God of Israel. When Moses and Aaron first approached him, they told him, this is what Yahweh, God of Israel says, let my people go that they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so, retorted Pharaoh. Who's Yahweh? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh. I will not let Israel go. Chapter 5 of Exodus. You can read the story. And God sent the plagues on Egypt. And sometimes Pharaoh seemed like he was going to yield and let his people go, or let the Israelites go. In chapter 9 of verse 34, it says, When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder ceased, that was plague number 7, he sinned again. Both he and his servants hardened their hearts. It wasn't just him. It was the servants around him hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart, it says, remained hard. He did not release the Israelites as the Lord predicted through Moses. And then we see the hardened heart of a nation, Israel. You know, I, I'm thinking of the Pharisees rejecting Jesus' claims to be Messiah through his own words and miracles. The hardness of their hearts were confirmed at some point. They passed the point of no return. And Jesus pronounced judgment on the nation of Israel when he said, your house is left to you desolate. He was speaking of the temple. It is no longer Yahweh's house. It is your house. You'll deal with it. And my grandfather, as he aged, developed what we understood as hardening of the arteries, it was called back then. And today we might know it as cholesterol or plaque buildup. But Paul uses the word for hardening from which we get our word sclerosis and that describes the hardening of the arteries or other parts of our body. And generally that condition doesn't take place quickly, which may give us the idea that spiritual hardening of heart in some people's lives takes place over a period of time. Some people hear the word of God, they hear the gospel about salvation, and sometimes they hear it multiple times. They may be in church all their lives, but they reject it over and over again. And they don't respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and their hearts are hardened. Remember, their, their hearts are hardened to start with, but that rejection over and over again hardens their hearts even more. Someone said the sun that melts butter hardens clay. And I think that's a very true statement as we look at these things here. Uh, that's what's exactly what's going on. You know, no one will ever go to hell saying God was mean and unjust and wouldn't let me into heaven. That's not the case at all. That won't ever happen. If Paul anticipates the new questions about God's sovereignty, though, and I like the way the New Living Translation says in verse 19, well then, you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? You know, that's like saying to God, it's your fault that I'm sinning. <laughs> that's not the case at all. Remember Adam's answer to God when God asked him if he ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Okay, blame the woman, blame God, and finally admit your fault, Adam. God's sovereignty does not free us from fault or personal guilt when we sin. Uh, we, we make bad choices. We choose to act out sin from our own desire to do what we know is wrong. God doesn't make us do what's wrong. I, I appreciate Paul our, uh, anticipating these questions. And then in verse 20, he focuses on our view of God. And he's, he's, uh, he, he really challenges us here. He says, but who indeed are you, a mere human being, to talk back to God? Does what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right to make from the same lump of clay a vessel for special use and another for ordinary use? Paul's paraphrasing Isaiah 29 and uh, uh, chapter 45 also. 
And in chapter 45, he says, what sorrow, or Isaiah says, what sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, what you're doing is wrong? Or does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? You know, God the potter has the prerogative to design and make and use his creations however he wishes because of who he is. He is the sovereign creator. Now, God has not made us puppets or robots, though. We have intellect and emotions and the ability to make choices and decisions and take action. And there again is one of those antinomies. I mean, that we cannot figure out how that works. And again, I go back to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 45, where God speaks of Cyrus. He says, I will raise Cyrus up to fulfill my righteous purpose. I will guide his actions. He will restore my city and free my captive people without seeking a reward. I, I Yahweh of heaven's armies, have spoken. Now, God told Isaiah this 150 years before Cyrus was even born. Cyrus would be a special instrument of God to restore Israel to the promised land after their captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Now, there's no place that God is pulling strings on Cyrus to make him do what God wants him to do, but somehow, and again, uh, we don't know how that works, God led Cyrus to do exactly what he said he was going to do, restore Israel to the promised land, give them back all the stuff that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from the, the temple. Uh, amazing how God does those things and how God leads us in similar ways. God is not pulling strings as if we were marionettes or puppets. And again, we go back to that lesson that God, as our sovereign creator, makes his own decisions about what he does. And he always works within the framework of his own perfect and holy character. But he uses people to accomplish his purposes, even though we don't understand how he does that. You know, Job had some indescribable trauma-type losses. You can read that in chapters 1 and 2 about what happened to Job. And obviously, that's a different sermon. You know, Job cried out to God in the midst of that serious physical and emotional and psychological and spiritual pain. And God invites our laments and cries to him. That's different than what Paul is talking about, uh, shaking our fist at God as the, uh, the pot uh, going after the potter. Um, and that's not what Job was, hap uh, Job was doing. Um, Job wanted to talk to God about God not treating him fairly through all of his suffering. Uh, he came very close to treating God just like another man. He wanted to march into God's court and have a mediator and present his case before God boldly. And God comes to Job personally and, and asks in chapter 38, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? And boy, Job backed down immediately. Um, and again, one of the great lessons of Job, especially in the end of that book, is that if you can't answer the, the science, quest, science test questions, you're not qualified to run your life. We need to let God do it. Well, as humans with sin natures, we often have, unfortunately, a disrespectful view of God, as if God's making mistakes in how he treats us. And this especially shows up when we are going through difficulties. And sometimes because of that, we may pull back from God and, and be distant toward him and even bitter at him. And there are many people that have given testimonies like that when we're suffering something. And, and it's, it's more likely, obviously, when difficulties are long term and, and they just kind of pile up one on top of each other. But you know, God desires our close relationship with him. Like King David said in one, uh, Psalm 139, he says, you know me to the nth degree, and I'm kind of summarizing and packing it in here. My sitting down, my rising up, you know my thoughts before I even think them. And then at the end of his psalm, he says, search me and see if there's any evil way with me, in me. You know, that was David's humility at that point. And uh, I like what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 6 and 7. It says, God will exalt you in due time if you humble yourselves under his mighty hand by casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. You know, we, we have God's care. Um, we see uh, that nothing can separate us from, uh, from him and from his love and from his grace. And God desires our love and our trust when we can't figure things out. When we walk through that valley, as David says in Psalm 23, he says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. If God is with us, 
what, what's going to happen to us? It might not be comfortable. We may hurt, and that's difficult to bear. But it, this involves our trust when we can't see things, uh, what's going on, when there are difficulties that we face that are beyond our, manage, ma our abilities to manage, when we hurt. I appreciate Pastor Daniel's comments about Romans 8.28 that God causes all things to work together, together for good to those who are called according to his purpose, which is to conform us to the image of Jesus, his character qualities. You know, the good that God wants to accomplish in our lives may not be for our comfort and healing. It may be to develop hearts of compassion and mercy and forgiveness and the endurance of faith uh, on that journey. Uh, you know, God brings many things into our lives that uh, produce those qualities and apart from those difficulties we might not have those qualities built into us. Paul asks two rhetorical questions in verses 22 and 24 to 24 and they're what-if questions and he doesn't really give an answer because there's an assumed answer which we'll get to in just a minute but he says what if God wants to demonstrate his wrath and power but was patient toward those who were the object of his judgment and what if God wants to demonstrate the wealth of his glory the object of his mercy to Jews and Gentiles. Well, that's the assumed answer. Well, God can do what he wants. He is sovereign. He has the right and the power and the prerogative to do what he wants to do. And he does it. And then Paul gives a couple of illustrations from the Old Testament prophets. Obviously, we're reaching back into the Old Testament a lot, and I hope that you read the Old Testament. The first one is from Hosea. Hosea, and I'm, again, I'm going to have to condense the story a great deal here. Hosea's wife had a couple children by other men. And the children's original names were really sorry names. One was Loami, which means not my people. It's like naming your child, not my child, if it wasn't. But how would you like to show up in third grade and, and have that name? I'm, I'm not my dad's child. And then Lo Ruhama, no mercy, uh, unloved. Boy, that, that's got to throw some... Um, you know, mental health issues on you as you grow up as a child. But God redeems that. And, and, and he's going to restore Israel. And these were pictures. And, you know, it must have been difficult on the family. But uh, Hosea was able to re redeem his wife. And uh, these children's names were changed. As he restores Israel and saves Gentiles, the names were changed to my people and my beloved. You know, God embraces them. You know, God doesn't leave us in the mess that we're in. He does redeem us. He can change us. And then Paul again goes back to Isaiah. And he says, Though the number of the children of Israel are like the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. A small number comparatively. God will execute his sentence on the earth completely and quickly. So this means that a small number of, of Jews will accept Jesus as Messiah comparatively to the, the large number of Jews in the world. And that, that's not a large group anyway. But here is God's mercy, isn't it? A remnant is just a small piece of cloth left from the large bolt of cloth. And a bolt is just a unit of measurement for uh, materials. And it can vary in length from yards to many, many yards. Uh, a bolt of canvas is traditionally 39 yards. And if you use most of that up and there's only a little piece left, that's called a remnant. You know, verse 29 amplifies the remnant in God's mercy. Um, the Lord says in Isaiah, if heaven, the Lord of heaven's armies had not left us descendants, we would become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. And he's asking the Jews to think back. What, what happened to those cities? Sodom and Gomorrah were totally destroyed and they have never been found. Archaeologists have some general idea where they were, but there's not a trace of those cities. What's the point? That God has acted in history and he will act in the future to us. Restore a remnant of Israel who will be believers in Jesus, Messiah. And God's grace and mercy will be demonstrated to the world. Now, Paul makes a conclusion to this discussion and our present situation in, in relation to national Israel and the Gentiles. Paul's statements were true when he wrote them, and they are still true today, because as he comes to these verses, the contrast is always between faith in God and our own works. Notice what he says in, in Romans 9.30, and I'm summarizing a little bit here, paraphrasing a little bit. The Gentiles were not looking for the righteousness with God. 
But when they heard the message of the gospel, many trusted Jesus to be their savior and they received the righteousness of God as a gift of grace. On the other side of the coin is Israel. They have worked for centuries, a, a couple, uh, to, to trying to keep their laws to obtain righteousness, but they can never attain it. And again, Paul uh, uh, anticipates the question, well, why not? And in verse 32 and 33, it says, because they pursued it not by faith, as if it were possible, but by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, look, I'm laying in Zion a stone that will cause people to stumble and a rock that will make them fall. Yet the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. Isaiah chapter 8, as well as in chapter 28. You know, Jesus was not the king that Israel was looking for. They thought Messiah would come and conquer the Romans and set up a political kingdom. And most of the Jews in Jesus' day stumbled over the spiritual message of repentance and faith in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, For the Jews demand miraculous signs and the Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach about a crucified Christ, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, Jesus healed many people, fed the 5,000. John chapter 6 tells us they wanted to make him king, but they did not want to deal with their sin problem. It offended them for Jesus to say that they needed to believe in him. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they were both Pharisees, but they believed Jesus. And in Acts chapter 6, after Jesus went back to heaven, we read, that many priests became obedient to the faith. So what are the takeaways? You know, God is the sovereign creator. Again, he makes his own decisions. He has the perfect plan and he moves that plan forward. He's not accountable to anyone. You know, what's, what's, our, what's our choice in that regard? Well, we can uh, argue with him, we can shake our fist at him, or we could submit to him. It, it's much better to submit to him. We will be blessed if we do. Trust him as our savior. You know, we don't see or understand how God is working out his perfect plan through godless people and leadership around the world. You know, that's discouraging. We don't see how God is working out his perfect plan, maybe in our lives, especially when we face difficulties. Many times when we face difficulties, when God is punishing us, and that, that may be not the case at all. And some things may be very hard. Uh, some things may be the level of traumas in our life that really uh, gets to us, um, uh, rewires our brains, and you know, God can redeem us from those things. Our side of the coin, though, is to keep trusting our Creator and saving Savior, knowing that He loves us, He shares our burdens, He will give us grace to keep moving forward until Jesus comes. You know, in my own family, um, during the years of my wife's cancer journey, uh, we learned many things. It was no walk in the park, but you know, perspective-wise, there are a lot of things worse than cancer. And God drew us both closer to him. When Marcia went home to be with the Lord, I can say honestly that over the last six years, God has drawn me closer to him as well. He's brought things into my life that have been beneficial, and even if though it's been difficult. You know, my family members, have, I've got four children and 13 grandchildren. Uh, they face various things that are going on, sometimes very difficult things because of uh, physical or disability limitations and, and things like that. And, you know, we all do that, but I, I'm confident that God is working out a perfect plan. And it is uh, both challenging and as well as rewarding. Third thing is that all of us need to be burdened about people, or well, I'm sure we are, let me back up, we are all burdened about people in our family or our friends that either don't know Jesus as their savior or maybe claim to be believers but are not living obedient lives for Jesus. Our side of the equation is to pray for them, to be kind, share the good news and the truth as we have opportunities. God's side of the equation is to convict them of their need for him and draw those people to himself. And then the fourth thing, the fourth takeaway is that God will exercise justice on all of his creation in his own time. It may not be in our lifetime. We may not live to see it, but there will be a judgment day. It's called the Great White Throne. You can read about it at the end of Revelation. And we can be certain of that, that he will not only judge 
uh, those that have not walked with him, that have rejected him, who have been evil in the world, in their lives. But on the other hand, he will pour out his eternal blessings, his wealth of glory on the objects of mercy, as Paul said. And we can be grateful that he's going to be doing both. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and for this passage that gives us confidence in who you are, that you do have a plan and that you are accomplishing it, even though we don't understand it all. Lord, help us just to simply take care of our responsibilities on our side of the equation. In Jesus' name, amen.
We hit this verse a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were in chapter 8. We just hit it briefly, but given what Paul mentioned today, I think it's good to look back again at Romans 11, uh, 33 to 36. Um, as we think not just about Israel, and because that's what we've been talking about through 9, and as we get into 10 and 11, it's still Israel, but uh, as we think about his sovereignty and who he is overall. Paul comes to this conclusion in this segment of chapters. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who is first given to God that God needs to repay him. We're not the ones with infinite knowledge, are we? Job, as Paul said, came to understand that very, very clearly as he began to, as God began to ask him all the questions there at the, the end of that book. But then 36, I think, wraps everything up and reminds us of where to keep our focus for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And just the important reminder that the world is about him. The word draws us to him, or points us to him, uh, and we're called to believe in him and have faith in him every day. Thanks for joining us today. Until next week, friends, God bless. Mm -hmm.